It is so exciting, timely, and hope-inducing that Mary Ellen Iskandarian, who for the past 11 years has served as president and CEO of Women's World Banking, joins us this evening. Women's World Banking is a global nonprofit devoted to giving more low-income women access to financial tools and knowledge and resources they require to achieve security and prosperity. Mary Ellen joins us having freshly returned from Paris and right before that Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, where she and Women's World Banking hosted their biennial Making Finance Work for Women Summit in late October. And with over 300 participants, more or less like this crowd tonight, at their at capacity event convened leaders from the financial services, consumer products, technology industries, investors, philanthropists, and government to discuss the most critical issues in women's financial inclusion today. At the Making Finance Work for Women Summit, Women's World Banking received an inaugural $20 million grant over five years from the newly incorporated Visa Foundation to develop sustainable solutions for women entrepreneurs to build their enterprises and establish financial safety nets. It's heartening to see this kind of corporate nonprofit partnership and timely support amid increasing worldwide awareness of how important it is to create strong citizen movements for change, to advance more collaboration across nonprofit, corporate, government, and academic sectors, so as to promote equity and inclusion in finance, employment, health, and education. Now, Mary Ellen, you are addressing tonight an audience of passionate individuals who keenly appreciate the connection between the individual transformations they experienced through international educational exchange and their roles in the world as transformers themselves. And dear fellow alumni and friends, um, a few more specifics about Mary Ellen Iskandarian, and I think you probably sensed her leadership from what I described. But not only does she lead the Women's World Banking Global Team based in New York, but she also serves as a member of the investment committee of its $50 million impact investment fund. Prior to Women's World Banking, she worked for 17 years at the International Finance Corporation, the private sector arm of the World Bank. And before that, she worked for the investment bank Lehman Brothers. She's a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a member of the Women's Forum of New York and of the Business and Sustainable Development Commission. Mary Ellen holds an MBA from the Yale School of Management and a Bachelor of Science in International Economics from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service right here in DC. So we welcome her tonight to one of her many homes away from home, a woman, a leader, who is making sure other women and their families have the opportunity to thrive. Thank you. Alison, thank you for such a generous introduction. I really have to live up to it now. Um, I am really so honored to be here with you this evening, particularly as a non-Fulbrighter, and to be given the chance to play even a small part in honoring the 40 years of the Fulbright Association's tremendous global impact. As everyone here tonight has already mentioned, the Fulbright program through its scholars has become an essential part of strengthening the bonds the United States has with the rest of the world. And closer to home, the organization I lead, Women's World Banking, has been a beneficiary of the Scholars Program. One of my star colleagues, Ryan Newton, was a Fulbright Scholar. When I mentioned that I was speaking at this event, she was very quick to tell me that her Fulbright experience had had a direct impact on her choice of career in international development. Her research into Spain's national immigration policy in the context of the European Union's policies had both political and economic implications, and her findings fueled her passion for gender equality and, happily, her subsequent decision to join Women's World Banking. 
Today, she lives in Mexico and leads our work with banks all over the world to create savings accounts and financial education programs for low-income women and girls. So, as Allison already mentioned, Women's World Banking is the global NGO that's dedicated to serving low-income women in developing countries with the financial tools and resources they need to achieve, importantly, both security and prosperity. Established in 1979, we're formally two years younger than you are as an organization, but many of our founding principles are remarkably similar, rooted in the belief that around the world, women and men have so much more in common than divides us. A group of visionary women came together at the first World Conference on Women in Mexico City in 1975, where they gathered to discuss gender equality and human rights for women. But they quickly concluded that without full economic and financial rights, neither equality nor the complete complement of human rights would ever be achievable for women. Since then, Women's World Banking has been studying the lives of women, listening to them, and working with local financial institutions to design solutions in the form of a savings account or an insurance policy or a loan to grow a business to meet a woman's needs and provide her with economic opportunities. Today, we work with 49 financial service providers in 32 company, countries, impacting the lives of 44 million people. But just having access to a safe place to save or an insurance policy to guard against unexpected health emergencies wouldn't be sufficient to fulfill the ambitions of those women who met in Mexico City. At Women's World Banking, we're focused on what happens when that woman gains control over her own finances, when she can decide wh whether she wants to use her earnings to pay for her daughter's education or reinvest to invest in her own business. How does her engagement with that product change her life and the lives of her family? We closely track the effects of a woman's use of financial services across four different types of change. The first is the most basic. Did she experience a material change in her life? Did more money come into her home? Has she increased her assets? And then secondly, did she gain any new skills or knowledge as a result of using this financial service? The third and fourth are perhaps harder to quantify, but I believe they're at the heart of the, the true nature of empowerment. Has she gained greater decision-making power in her, in her household? Does she participate more in the life of her community? Is she safer from physical and sexual violence in her home and workplace? And lastly, how has her sense of herself changed? Has the financial interaction allowed her to gain more self-esteem? There are more than a billion women around the world who don't have the chance to experience these kinds of changes simply because they don't have a bank account in their own name. And that number explodes to closer to three billion women when we include those who don't have access to more than one financial service. These are the women that Women's World Banking seeks to serve. Women like Nwakpa, who runs a busy fruit stall in an open-air market in Lagos, Nigeria. Nwakpa tried to save for years so that she could buy a bigger fruit stall and ensure that she had enough money left at the end of each month to pay the school fees for her seven children. When Diamond Bank, a large bank in Nigeria, began to see the opportunity in expanding their presence into the low-income market, they came to us to understand how to go about meeting the needs of potential clients like Nwakpa. So Nwakpa told us that she needed a safe place to save that was convenient, that was confidential, and that was very safe and secure. She said she had no time to leave her busy fruit stall to go stand in line at some bank branch. And perhaps even more important was the emotional distance that she felt from the bank when she said that the bank really wasn't for her and that they probably wouldn't want her as a client and they certainly weren't going to treat her with any respect. So we set out to design a solution with Diamond Bank that would specifically address her concerns. And in fact, Ryan, our Fulbright scholar, was one of the architects of this product. So Shaz tells me I've been mispronouncing the name of this product all along. Um, it's called Betta. Shaz, I hope I got that right. <laughs> 
Okay, there, you heard. <laughs> and it's basically a very, very simple bank account that Nwakpa and the women who, um, who've taken advantage of it can open through their cell phone, can access with an ATM card, they can open it with a cell phone photo and not really any more documentation than that. And what we quickly found is that they love the technology, they love the convenience, but what they really loved was, and I'm gonna mispronounce it again, the, the group of people that we introduced called the Beta Friends, which were, we, we originally decided we wanted to just have them um, interact with the women, give them a little bit of training on the cell phone, some financial education, but quickly we found that close to 70% of all of the savings that were mobilized through this account were done through that individual. It was that individual human face of the bank along with the technology that really drove the women to use the account and to consider it a safe place to save. And so that's really informed the way we're working um, today with digital financial services in trying to balance technology and that human interaction. So back to Nwakpa. Nwakpa, two years later, we find her already in that larger stall she'd been talking about, and all seven of her children, both the boys and importantly the girls, are planning to attend university. So we've seen the impact on Nwakpa's and her family's lives, but what about the impact on the bank? Would Diamond Bank have seen the business opportunity in serving someone like Nwakpa even five years ago? Probably not. In the last decade, mobile technology has driven down the cost of serving low-income customers. As a result, banks like Diamond now finally have the business rationale that they need to see Nwakpa as a client rather than as a charity case or a victim and to serve her well with financial products and services. And those banks are smart because women are really great clients of financial service providers. At all income levels, women are better repayers of loans than men. Sorry, gentlemen in the room. It just, it just is what it is. Um, and they tend to be longer term, and for the bankers in the room, you'll know this, stickier savers. So they deposit and they keep the, bank, the money in the bank. And even if they make less money than their husbands, they are still more often than not the household risk managers. And so again, at every income level, we see women buying more insurance than men. We also know that they're more loyal clients and we see dramatically higher retention rates of women clients if that bank or insurance company or other financial service provider can gain, provider can gain their trust. That untapped market for financial services to this un- and underserved group of women is estimated at over $1 trillion. So at Women's World Banking, we believe this tremendous opportunity for financial service providers and the women they serve really can only be realized through digital financial services. So I want to pause for a moment and re-engage with technology and show you a video that I hope brings some of that promise to life and um, be on the lookout for Nwakpa because she's in this video. So let me see here. Technology can bring financial services closer to women. Mobile phones and banking agents can reduce the risk, the cost, and the distance of financial transactions for women. Women face a number of barriers in their access to financial services. They often have limited mobility and an inability to leave the home. In Malawi, women are mostly breadwinners. They have got a lot of responsibilities. They have to do some businesses, do household work at the same time. So we looked at that and say they do not really have much time to go out to where our service centers are, which is normally quite a distance. So in order to save them money and the time, we developed this product, which is uh, being distributed to the customers through what we call agents. And these agents are located within the vicinity of where these people live such that they have to walk a very small distance to get to the agent and do banking transactions. Mm -hmm. 
Dedi matamu na kumche dwa bantu tisme rufna dwange. Koma na sanga la sidwa ni banki fukandi aifu busi tika aso balaini. Tuma bezeka wudi da figa mu na balimu mo zantwa win. Tuma ringa drama mo sabuda. Kusiana ukubwa wuda banki. Koma sodo maseva transport. Wudi kido banki tibwe rufu dwa kubwa la bantu mangu enda ni endo kudenga drama. Technology is allowing financial service providers to bring their services directly to the woman. We're seeing great success with digital tools in terms of in-field account opening, doorstep service collection, and we're now starting to see partnerships where existing informal savings groups are partnering with banks to bring more women into the formal financial system. Digital financial services represent a huge opportunity to close the gender gap in financial inclusion. That's a better system for us. It has saved us from losing our money, from, you know, people that we don't know. But this one, you get it right into your phone. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> it is clearly cheaper. It's clearly more flexible and digital helps you track. So it gives you a history, sort of like a footprint of the customer and it helps you refine your products, you know, better than physical will ever do. We've seen a real shift at Women's World Banking in that today almost all of the projects that we're engaged in have some digital component because we really believe that digital financial services can be the key to closing the gender gap in financial inclusion. So I think I owe you an apology. I seem to have brought the version without footnote, um, without subtitles. But um, that woman was a client in Malawi who was telling us all about what the ability to uh, to transact right there on her phone, right in her own village, um, was going to be able to do for her business and the fact that she wanted to start trading um, it, with towns further away, but I, I am sorry that I didn't give you the uh, the subtitles. Nwakpa was the one with the you know wow at the end, so <laughs> so we like her a lot. Um, so I think the video probably clearly states the case for providing digital financial services to women. Um, in fact, mobile technology uh, we feel really uniquely addresses women's three most frequently requested attributes for any financial product. Security, they really need and want some for, something that's safer than saving in the mattress. And they also really don't want to be carrying around large amounts of cash and, and incurring great risk. Convenience, as you heard in the video, as you heard in WACPA, that they don't really have the time to be going and standing uh, in line or traveling long distances to the bank. And confidentiality is huge. So many women have said that they don't want other members of their family, their neighbors, their husbands to know that they're saving or why they're saving. And so the ability to do that through technology is, is tremendous. But as I've really reluctantly come to realize, even something as seemingly innocuous as a cell phone brings with it a whole lot of gender baggage. Um, technology is anything but gender blind. Women around the, own, around the world own 200 million fewer cell phones than men, and they have much lower awareness of what their opportunities with that cell phone are, and in general, lower financial and digital literacy. But perhaps even more persistent are the cultural and social norms that prevent women from engaging with digital financial services. For instance, in Pakistan, we're partnering with a cell phone company called Jazz, um, that offers a mobile wallet called Jazz Cash. Jazz saw that women represent only 15% of Jazz Cash customers, but once they become customers, there's virtually no difference in how women and men use the account. So they, they brought us in to see if we could address what was mysteriously driving that, keeping that number so low. So the most common channel for opening an account uh, for Jazz Cash is through agents, and you saw those agents in very small shops and kiosks. And guess what? 95% of the uh, Jazz Cash agents are men. And in order to open an account with Jazz, the customer has to provide that agent with her cell phone number. So as you probably imagine, that's just not gonna happen <laughs> in Pakistan. So literally every step in Jazz Cash's customer acquisition process was a distinct disincentive for women to sign up for an account. 
So our work has been quite simple. We've been very explicitly focused on what are the alternative ways to onboard new women clients? So the women told us that they had heard of jazz, um, but they didn't know any other women who used it. And that, interestingly, they thought that a referral from a woman would be particularly important for something as important as financial services. They also, uh, they, so, so our work has really been focused on building a woman's referral system and establishing an affinity group. And we're also, we're very excited about this, we're also partnering with Unilever to use a set of distribution channels they've established of women kiosk owners who now can become jazz agents. And, and we think there's a real possibility of driving up women's usage. But even the best design product and the most accessible technology won't drive women's financial inclusion without bold, courageous leadership. So I'd like to close my remarks with two stories about leaders who, for me, epitomize the impact that a single person can have. Um, the first is Uzoma Dozier, and he's the CEO of Diamond Bank in Nigeria, the bank that, that uh, was serving Nwakpa. Um, Diamond was, about four or five years ago, the fourth largest corporate bank in the country, and they didn't have any retail presence. So Uzoma uh, was appointed CEO, and he really wanted to establish a retail presence, but all of the other competing banks had kind of already uh, we're already serving that middle-income uh, market. And so the low-income market was the only one open to him. Um, but he recognized that technology was going to be the only way he could reach that market um, in an affordable way. Since then, he's made significant investments uh, in technology, and his commitment to financial inclusion has been absolutely unwavering. But he figured something out long before a lot of other leaders do, and it's something that we've seen in many banks around the world, that institutions that have women on their boards um, and in their management tend to serve more women clients. So he realized he needed to build a gender-diverse leadership team if he wanted to change the bank's strategy. So through middle and senior management leadership training that we've provided alongside the Wharton School of Business, um, Diamond Bank's leadership team today is over 50% female, and they are an absolute example um, in leading the way in financial inclusion for Nigeria. And then the other um, example of a powerful leader um, that's addressing financial inclusion comes from our partner bank in Tanzania, NMB. We began working with the bank a few years ago, and the CEO made it very evident that he thought our work together was you know, very nice, something let's keep it on the side, but there was no way that it was part of his core business. So we had a couple of star stops and starts and projects that we thought made a lot of sense, we could make strong business cases, but really went nowhere. And then we got word that there was a new CEO who'd been appointed, and the new CEO, maybe only coincidentally, was a woman, a woman named Inika Busemacher. She had immediately re realized the power in reaching low-income women and girls, particularly with products that let them build assets. So under her leadership, the bank became the first bank in Tanzania to offer a savings account called Wajibu to low-income children and their parents. Probably no surprise that the highest savings balance came in the combination of girls saving alongside their mothers. Inika also said about changing the culture in the organization that had prevented the bank from really moving forward. And she too invested heavily in building women's leadership throughout the organization, and she's now the executive sponsor of a Women's Affinity Network in the bank. So the theme of this week's events, now more than ever, is particularly resonant for me. Um, I'm by nature a really optimistic person, and I believe both the business and the moral case for gender equality are persuasive and will ultimately prevail. But this week, we had some really discouraging news. The World Economic Forum published their annual Global Gender Gap Report, which measures the rate of gender parity around the world in health, education, economic participation, and political representation. For the first time since the WEF began collecting this data, the gender gap has widened, and progress in achieving parity in economic participation in particular has completely stalled. 
At the current rate of change, it will take 217 years to close the gender gap. With all that's going on today, I'm not sure, sure the world can afford to wait that long. Now more than ever, we need people like you Fulbrighters who can take the same passion and curiosity that brought you into this program and apply it to solving the world's most intractable problems. And since I am an optimist at heart, I'd like to think that some of you will choose to join Ryan Newton and me in serving as many of those three billion women as possible. That way, everyone can enjoy all the benefits that will only be possible when women are full participants in the economies of their society. And I sure as heck hope it can be done in less than 217 years. Thank you so much for your attention.